What's up guys? Welcome to another episode of Captured Killers. My name is Kim and if you like true crime like I do, hit that subscribe button. Hit it, hit it, hit it. Just hit it if you want to. Today we are going to be talking about the case of Sheila Davalou. Sheila Davalou killed her lover's fiance, but she was only caught after trying to kill her husband. This story is crazy. Sheila was the type of person, okay, so just envision the movie Mean Girls and how they're in the cafeteria and you have the mathletes over here, you have the jocks over here. Well, there's one table set up and who's gonna be sitting at that table with Sheila is Casey Anthony, Jody Aries. You know, they're gonna tailgate with Scott Peterson and Chris Watts. I mean, Sheila, was a narcissist to the next level. She only cared about herself. Before we get into the story, let's start with the comment of the week. And this comment is from the last video, the Amber and Josh Hilberling story. That was a crazy story. This is from Brie Love. And it says, it's always the pretty girls that are insane. I love this series. Keep up the good work. Oh, very sweet. Thank you so much, Brie. <laughs> Sheila's parents immigrated from Iran and had Sheila in 1969. They then, when Sheila was two years old, decided to move back to Iran. So Sheila and her parents and her brother all lived in Iran for the next 10 years. And when Sheila was 12 years old, they decided to move back to the U.S. because of the Iranian Revolution. Her parents were very successful medical and healthcare professionals. So they moved to New York to the suburb of Yorktown Heights. Sheila came from a very gifted family of professionals, but they also had their Iranian traditions. So just out of high school, at age 19, Sheila was to marry, and Sheila describes it as an arranged marriage. But she also wanted to further her education like her parents, and so she enrolled to the University of Stony Brook in New York. She earned her degree, her bachelor's degree, in biochemistry, and that's not an easy degree to get, so good for her. But she wanted to continue her education. Sheila was very smart. She furthered her education by attending graduate school in the New York Medical College. She wanted more than anything to become a scientist. So she's married, but she's going to school and she meets a gentleman by the name Paul Christos. And Sheila was just drawn to him. She was very attracted to him. Paul was very smart. And so they had a lot in common. So what happened? Sheila and Paul started an affair. They started spending more and more time together. But all this time, Paul had no idea that she was married. Paul was completely clueless that she had a husband. Sheila was definitely a master manipulator. And you'll, you'll see more of that later. The affair with Paul lasted about a year. But Paul, Sheila's lover, got a call from her husband. Sheila's husband, Farid Mas Masavi, I hope I'm saying that right, gave Paul a call and said, hey, will you meet me for coffee? And so Paul agreed and Farid and Paul met together. They had coffee. It was described as a very civil conversation. Farid described Sheila as this drama queen. Always, There's always chaos following her. And then of course, Paul described her as you know, level-headed. And so it was so different how they described this person. Farid ends up divorcing Sheila. He had had enough. He found out about the affair. It was confirmed that they were having an affair. He was done. But despite all of this, Paul and Sheila stayed together. They were together for the next eight years and then they finally married in 2000, which is crazy that Paul forgave her. He just, he wasn't really bothered by it. They didn't get married right away. It was after eight years, but they finally did get married in 2000. Just a year after they were, they were married, Sheila and Paul bought a house. It was in Pleasantville, New York. Pleasantville, it's just, Kind of ironic. This is located just north of New York City. It was a convenient 
commuting distance between both of their jobs. Paul worked at Cornell University at its New York City campus, while Sheila landed her job in research as a scientist at Purdue Pharma, which was located in Sanford, Connecticut. So they were each able, in Pleasantville, their commutes were, you know, manageable. But just one year after their marriage, Sheila and Paul were kind of growing apart. Paul at this time is now working on his PhD, was still teaching as well. Sheila was working really long hours at Purdue Pharma. So they just weren't communicating. They weren't really having much luck in the bedroom. So things were just kind of fizzling out for them. So in the summer of 2001, just one year after they were married, they were going through some other struggles. Sheila had a brother who was schizophrenic and Sheila told Paul that her brother doesn't know about either of her marriages. He just has his mental problems. He only comes to visit every once in a while. I'm not going to burden him with this information. So could he just leave while her brother comes to visit? And Paul being the nice guy that he is, he would pack a bag. He would go stay with a friend. He would go stay at a hotel. He'd go visit his parents. But in the meantime, they would remove all pictures. They would remove any clothes, any toiletries, anything. Paul basically was just erasing his existence from that house when her brother came to visit. And so Initially, Paul agreed to this, but then it just became more and more often. And so this was really upsetting Paul. He's like, I'm, I'm just not doing this anymore. I can't do it. It's too much. Well, come to find out, Sheila had met a man named Nelson Sessler at her job at Purdue Pharma. She started an affair with him. And Nelson, once again, when asked later, he had no idea she was married because when he went to go visit her, there was no husband there. He's like, he, she couldn't have been married. There, there was nothing in that house that said a man lived there. Paul was helping Sheila remove him so her boyfriend, her lover, could come over and stay with her. It's just unbelievable. What? What? I can't believe the nerve of this woman. It's just amazing. So Paul was actually helping his cheating wife remove any trace of his existence in the home, packing up his clothes, all of his toiletries, photographs, before going off to spend the night with, you know, a friend, a hotel, or wherever. It's just amazing. But Nelson wasn't a victim here. The lover that didn't know about Paul, he actually started a relationship with another co-worker that worked at Purdue Pharma, and her name was Annalisa Raimundo. I'm telling you, Purdue Pharma, this place is hotter than Tinder meets Pleasure Island. Like, everybody's dating somebody. The place is crazy. But eventually he does break things off with Sheila and he moves in with Annalisa and they eventually become engaged. Uh, Nelson described the breakup with him and Sheila as being very calm and Sheila took it very well. She said that it was just a summer, a summer fling, no big deal. But that was not the case at all. Sheila was obsessed over Nelson and was planning and plotting to get Anna out of the picture. She wanted Nelson to herself. So talking through things, what Sheila does is she just starts talking to her husband about this love triangle at work and how she's trying to help her friends out. Paul, the husband, later in life testified about these daily conversations that Sheila would have with him between Melissa, Annalisa, and a guy named Jack, which in all honesty, it was her, Nelson, and Annalisa, but Melissa, Annalisa, and Jack. She would ask her husband, Paul, for like advice on what he thinks each person should do. I know during the trial when Paul put two and two together, he was like, what the f 
Sheila admitted to Paul that she would spy on Annalisa and Jack with Melissa and wanted to break into Annalisa's apartment just to look at the photos. Um, why? On the morning of November 8th, 2002, Annalisa was found in her apartment. She was stabbed multiple times in the face, neck, and chest. Annalisa suffered a blunt force trauma to her head. Annalisa was in shape. She worked out often, so she put on one heck of a fight. The scene was very gruesome. Next to Annalisa's body was a dumbbell. Most likely was the final blow for Annalisa. So guess who did it? But this is what Sheila does. To get the police completely off of her trail, she goes to a diner that's across. Uh, Annalisa lived in some Stamford apartments. They were upscale apartments on some water, so they were pretty nice. But she walks over to a diner where there's a payphone and she calls 911. She gives a fake description, okay? And in this, I'm gonna read her her um, quote here. I, I think a guy is attacking my neighbor. I don't know her name, but she's my neighbor and she lives in 105. I saw a guy go in her apartment. So Sheila, during this 911 call, never identified herself. And she hung up after she fumbled with the address. The 911 dispatcher called back and discovered that the call had been from a payphone at a restaurant near, near the crime scene. The restaurant manager couldn't recall, he was questioned later, he could not recall seeing anyone at that payphone. So the responding um, to the 911 call, of course, police were on their way to Annalise's apartment. This is from police, uh, the state police captain, Richard Conklin. They opened the door and walked into a horrific, violent assault scene. The walkway from the door was a bloody mess, things thrown and knocked about. Again, I just think Annalisa was not going down without a fight. So the apartment itself showed no signs of force entry. So that tells me, well, potentially guessing, of course, that potentially because Annalisa knew Sheila that she willingly let her in, she didn't get far into the door. The door was still open as well. When the officers came, the door was like cracked open. So the police are just getting samples from everywhere because there's blood all over. And so what they said is that they're looking for traces of blood from other than Annalisa because oftentimes when there's a stabbing case that the knife itself gets slippery. It's often that when a blow goes down, your hand will slip onto the blade, which will cause there to be blood, which they want that DNA. So they're swabbing everything. And so they were able to get a drop of blood that was on the bathroom sink. So Sheila had cut herself on her hand and went to go clean her hands off in the sink and only left that trace of blood on the handle that opens and closes, you know, turns on and off the water. So lucky for officers, for sure. Nelson noticed later on that Sheila had a, a cut on her hand and she said that she got it from opening up a dog food can. So who was Annalisa? Annalisa, like Sheila's parents, immigrated over to the U.S. from the Philippines. And they were both doctors. They were very intelligent people, just like Sheila's upbringing. Uh, Annalisa was born September 11th, 1970, uh, was, lived in Brooklyn, New York. And she had worked with, of course, Nelson and Sheila at Purdue Pharma, but she actually got a different job. And she was working at another pharmaceutical company in New Jersey. And she was home that evening, that Friday, because she typically worked at home on Fridays, but Nelson had to go to work. So he wasn't home and that's when the incident took place. Annalisa was 
super intelligent. She went to Harvard and then she continued her education at Stanford. So Sheila calls 911. The police come and they're investigating the crime scene. They have it all taped off and everything. Nelson pulls up, which is Annalisa's fiance, Sheila's lover. <laughs> Hopefully I'm keeping this straight for you guys. But Nelson arrives home to the to Annalisa's place, his fiance, and he is just super calm. Like he just cannot be bothered. It's no big deal. And he's completely unaware of what what's happened, but clearly something happened, but he's just like, Hmm. Yeah. And so the investigators were just super suspicious of him. Like he, nobody acts this way. This is crazy. They told him about Annalisa's death and he just was like, okay, he wasn't crying. He would, wasn't screaming who would do this, you know, nothing. He's just kind of like, whatever. And so there was a common area that had like a couch in it. So the police asked him to wait there and that they'd be right back, you know, to ask him some questions or whatnot. And so he's sitting on this couch. The police go on, do their police work or whatever. They come back and he's sleeping. He's taking a nap. His fiance just was found brutally murdered and he's taking a nap. And so they noticed a cut on his hand. So they were like, this guy is guilty. Like he must be guilty. Who, who acts like that? And so they were able to pull up the records. He was at work. They have a punch-in system. They have security cameras watching you at all times and then a punch out. So there was just no time that he could have ever committed this crime. So he was ruled out. But that doesn't mean he wasn't involved. I mean, they never proved anything, but don't you think that's so weird that he acted that way? Took a nap? Like either he was in on it or he was getting high on those drugs from Pharma or Purdue Pharma. So Nelson's cleared and they just, they have no idea who this is. Sheila had called and said that she's seen a man go in. And so they're, searching for a male and they're basically not getting anywhere. They're having no luck whatsoever. And when she called, when Sheila called 911, she said that she was Sheila's neighbor. So of course the police are just canvassing everywhere in the apartment complex wondering who called 911 because it was suspicious. Sheila was giving out different addresses. I'm at 123, 103, 105, like she was just throwing numbers out. And of course, nobody knew or heard or seen anything. So Sheila thought that she was off the hook. The police had nothing. They had this blood print, but nothing was coming back. There was nothing in the system to compare it to. So Sheila was in the clear. Annalisa, her lover's fiance, is no longer in the picture. So what does Sheila do? She wants to help Nelson. She just wants to be there at a at his side in a time that he needs somebody. And, and she just wants to help him and console him. Yeah, that didn't take long. Within, I don't know, six months or something in 2003, in January 2003, they were already back in bed together. She's cheating on her husband, and then Nelson is none the wiser that she even has a husband. Sheila's asking Paul to get out of the house again and remove all of his things so her lover could come over. But then Sheila's thinking, this old husband of mine, I, you know, I want Nelson to myself. I, I got to get rid of this husband. Divorce? Mm, too much work. Ain't nobody got time for that. That's in Sheila's mind. Sheila made the decision that she needed to get rid of her husband because she wanted to be with Nelson full time. She wasn't getting along with Paul. She couldn't do it the old school way. So it was a Saturday afternoon. It was March 22nd, 2003. Sheila and Paul were both at home. And so Sheila says to Paul, hey, do you want to play a game? It's a spicy game, you know? I'm going to handcuff you to the chair and blindfold you. And then I'm gonna grab some stuff around the house. And then I'm gonna rub it on you and you have to guess what it is. Ooh, spicy, right? Fun? Okay. Sheila goes first. Paul blindfolds her, handcuffs her to the chair and he goes and gets, 
you know, a few items and one of them is a remote and he like rubs it on her face. And so Sheila guesses and then it's Paul's turn. So she ties Paul up, blindfolds him and she has, a, you know, a few items and, you know, they're having fun and yada, yada, yada. And so Sheila says, oh, I just, one more thing. And Sheila ran down to the kitchen, came back, sat on his lap and stabs him. So Paul is just describing this immense thrust on his chest that he felt. Well, then Sheila stabs him again. So Paul is like, what's going on? You know, and so Sheila jumps up. She takes the blindfold off of him and he looks down and he's like, I'm bleeding. So Sheila was like, oh, oh no, I, it was an accident. I don't know what happened. But in the meantime, she's not undoing the handcuffs. So Paul is just sitting there bleeding and he's like, Un undo the handcuffs. And she's like, oh my God, I can't find the key. I have no idea where the key is. How are we going to get you out of there? And so they end up breaking the chair. And as soon as Paul moves, there's the key right there. And so Sheila takes the handcuffs off of him. And Paul's like, Sheila, call 911. Like, get the ambulance here. So Sheila goes outside, comes back inside and says, they said they'll get here when they can. Um, so we just got to hang tight. So 30 minutes goes by, right? 30 minutes. Nobody shows up. Paul's like, you need to take me to the hospital. And she's like, okay, let me call back. And then she calls back and she says, oh, they're really busy. So I'm going to run to the clinic and grab a doctor for you. I'll be right back. Just stay right here, Paul, okay? So she runs out of the house. Paul said she was only gone for a matter of five minutes, like not enough to run to a clinic and back. And she walks in the house and says, oh, they're closed. Sorry. And so now Paul is just begging, please just take me to the hospital. So Sheila th throws him in the back seat, right? And she drives like she's driving to the hospital. But she passes the ER and she pulls to like a remote area of the parking lot that's not in front of the ER. And so Paul's like, what the heck is going on? And so then Sheila comes around the car, opens up his door. Paul sees something shiny. What is it? Oh yeah, it's the knife. She goes in and stabs him again. Again, she stabs him. So this time he manages to get the knife out of her hand and he threw it, but now he's out of the car and he's really bleeding. At this point, he's bleeding pretty heavily. This is the third time he's been stabbed. So he's in the parking lot and Sheila pulls away. She just pulls away. Luckily, there was some some witnesses, some bystanders that seen all this happen. So they came over to help Paul. And of course, they called 911. They had the ambulance and the police on the way. Sheila sees in her rear view mirror that there's people there with Paul. So what does she do? She turns around, comes back, and tries to load him again up in her car. Luckily, those people were like, you're not going anywhere with him. I have an ambulance coming. They'll be here anytime. And they're right by the ER. Like, where's she going? So, of course, Sheila's like, oh, I don't know what happened. It was an accident. And, you know, she's just making up all these stories. The police take her to the police department. She is just making, she's just throwing the lies out. I mean, they're just... They're just flowing. Nothing is lining up with their stories. Nothing's making sense. The man is having open heart surgery. Sheila nicked his heart. Luckily, she was only using a paring knife. If she was using anything just a slight bit longer, Paul would not be here. But luckily, it was a paring knife. She only nicked the heart, which, I mean, not only because he did have to have open heart surgery. He, he survived. But in the meantime, Sheila's not asking how is Paul doing at all? She was not concerned. What she was concerned about is, can you have somebody let my dogs out for me? How long am I going to be here? And then her continuing to tell her lies and blah. So remember when I said that Sheila told Paul that she was calling 911, but she went outside to make that call? What she was doing, this will give you an idea of who Sheila is. She was not calling 911. She was calling her lover, Nelson, 
to see if he could come over and hang out with her between, you know, 8.30, 9 o'clock. What? Oh yeah, she, she didn't call 911. She called her boyfriend, see if he wanted to hang out that night. You know, she, she was gonna be free that evening. Sheila was never free again. Because she made that phone call, police were able to go and talk to Nelson, the lover, and say, hey, you know, I see that she called you because when she called him, it was in between stabbings. She had stabbed him and then drove him to the parking lot. Well, when she said she was calling 911, she was actually calling Nelson. So the police obviously want to know, who's, who is this guy? Why is she calling him? Is he involved? So they go to question Nelson. Nelson said that he can't believe that she was even married. She never said that she was married. I used to stay at her house. And I can't believe I'm going through this because my girlfriend was killed, you know, just a couple months ago. So the police officers were like, could Sheila have something to do with Annalisa's murder? And so that's when they discovered that possibly the two cases were connected together. A detective carpenter heard the 911 tapes, right? And she's like, that sounds exactly like Sheila Davalu's voice. I swear that must be Sheila. And so in 2004, Sheila was found guilty of attempted murder and assault for stabbing her then husband. They had since got divorced, but 2004, she was found guilty, right? Without a doubt, they were like, she clearly did it. She was throwing those lies out like crazy. You know, first she's like, he came home because she thought that Paul had died. And so she was making up stories thinking that he had died, but Paul made it. So he was able to tell the whole story. So everything that she said, all of her lies just were like all caught up. And she, that woman couldn't tell the truth if She's still lying to this day. Like she literally is on TV lying today. So she was sentenced to the maximum of 25 years. <laughs> they were not messing around with her because just because she was so cold blooded and all of her secret and lies and sneakiness and whatever. So at this point, they are getting their case together on Annalisa. They already had evidence that that could be her voice, but they're checking everything. And because she was arrested for Paul's murder, they were able to get her DNA. So now her DNA is in the system. And what was left on that bathroom sink handle? Sheila's blood. Yup. So the prosecution rested with those two pieces of evidence, her voice and the blood, which was pretty solid, honestly, pretty solid. But being in a Jody Aris type of master manipulator lying piece of work, Sheila decided that she was going to represent herself, right? She's going, she doesn't need a lawyer. She is smart, don't get me wrong. And I'm sure that she, she did self-teach her all this stuff. She was pretty smart. Like, I'll give her that. I mean, she wasn't a very good liar, but she, <laughs> she was smart. She was book smart. So she represented herself. It's just insane. Not long after, Sheila was found guilty for Annalisa's murder with, with those two pieces of evidence. And so she got 50 years for Annalisa. She has 75 years of jail time. And that woman, she's not getting out of jail. She is constantly, she's constantly entering appeals, but it just never goes in her, her way. But what's crazier than ever is that Paul stuck by her, the husband who she stabbed. He, during the, his trial and Annalisa's trial, that he was saying that he, he doesn't want her to go to prison, that he just wants her to get help. I mean, this man was literally on her side after everything. I think Sheila only thinks about Sheila. I really don't think she cares about him at all. I mean, this is even after Paul knows all the facts. He knows that she's having an affair. She knows that she, he's been leaving his house so she could have her lover over. She knows that she tried to stab him so she could be with her lover. Like, he knows all that and he still 
sticking up for. It just made my heart sink. I'm like, Paul, you can do better. And I hope he is. I hope he found somebody. And then on the episode of Snap that I was watching, they brought up after she's already in jail, already been sentenced for both of them, there was another lady that worked with Sheila at, uh, I can't remember what it was, but it was another company. And this is long before Anna and Paul and all them. So she was working at a different company and this lady was killed in her apartment or house, hit over the head with something and stabbed to death. Sound familiar? Yeah, they were never able to get any DNA from her body. They have no idea who did it. And um, on her calendar, she had the name Nelson. But what's funny about that is the police were like, we got it. Yep, he, Nelson was dating her too. And so so Sheila got rid of her, but it ends up that it was a band that she liked. So it wasn't it wasn't Nelson. He, he didn't even know who she was. So yeah, it's just weird that they work together and they cannot find anybody. They cannot find her killer. So they question Sheila about it, but Sheila denies everything. She denies Annalisa's body or death, uh, her being the murderer. She'll die saying I didn't do it. She'll die lying. When they came to interview her, Sheila was like, I am the perfect suspect for this, but I did not do it. <laughs> and of course they didn't have enough evidence to prove that she did or didn't do it. So of course they just kind of went away, but I was like, maybe she did do it. It sounds just like Annalisa, a knife and bludgeon to the head like it sounds eerily similar and it, she worked with Sheila like Sheila you know you don't want to work with Sheila you don't want to be married to her and you don't want to work with her so that is the case of Sheila Davalu you guys she is she's a crazy one I'm super glad that she is in prison and she will not be able to hurt anybody else. I honestly feel that she is a danger wherever she is. I think that she would, she would hurt again. She, her only interest in life is her own and a means to an end. How, to, how do I get what I want and will manipulate anybody and anything around her to get it? That's Sheila. I tell ya, when I reviewed this case, I was just like, like I, my jaw just kept on hitting the ground. I'm like, what? She did what? That's Sheila. Let me know your guys' thoughts down in the comments. I really appreciate it. And I'll see you in my next one. Thanks so much for watching. Bye.